Hello, good afternoon, and welcome uh, to Toronto Rehab. Uh, we're sitting here, uh, for those of you that are here at Toronto Rehab today, we're at uh, the University Centre, uh, located on University Avenue in the, the middle of Discovery District. Uh, today's topic in the Blakely Health Innovation Series, uh, this webinar and live session, is a really important one. Um, and it's something that, either directly or indirectly, I think we all have dealt with at uh, some time. So today's session, and it's on the screen uh, right beside me, is uh, regarding anxiety and depression. And for those in the audience today, most of you, uh, many staff actually, uh, of Toronto Rehab, the reality is we see and we care for people um, that are experiencing the hardest moments of their lives. Um, they're experiencing stroke, spinal cord injury, brain injury, and a host of other conditions. And the reality is that you don't just treat what's broken, you treat the whole person. And so the saying of treating body, mind, spirit really holds true here at Toronto Rehab. Today is a very special day because it's not just uh, a session that we're doing and beaming out to, I think around a thousand people have logged on online. Um, today's Bell Let's Talk Day. And across Canada, Bell is hosting and supporting a, a number of causes. There are events like ours right across Canada. Um, I'm going to uh, make a shout out. Uh, Bell is donating uh, for every uh, interaction uh, to uh, hashtag Bell Let's Talk. We'll be donating support. They've been doing this for years on this uh, one particular day. I understand um, they've raised through Bell Let's Talk over the years uh, over $90 million for mental health causes uh, across Canada, including right here at Toronto Rehab. I believe their goal is to go over $100 million today. And so if we can, yeah, round of applause. <laughs> if we can help Bell help us and our community by hashtagging Bell Let's Talk, we come together and we do great things and we help people that really uh, need our support now and in the future. So uh, we have an interactive session. Um, it's really important that if you have a question uh, while our speakers are up uh, sharing with you information, that uh, you send uh, a message to trf at uhn.ca. And I'll repeat that, it's trf at uhn.ca. And later in today's session, we will be fielding the questions. And um, please do ask, it's, it's important. Um, I do want to make a shout out to a number of sponsors uh, that have made this possible. Firstly, uh, Bob Blakely, who was chair of the board of the foundation a couple of years ago. Uh, this session, this webinar, and these live sessions that we host are thanks to him. Uh, really, he was the, the brainchild along with uh, my colleague Arlene Boyce, who developed uh, this whole uh, series sessions uh, that we do many times a year. I'd also like to um, acknowledge Liquorland Capital, FAF Motors, uh, 19 Lawyers, and Functionability for their support today. So it really is a special day uh, because it's Bell Let's Talk, because Bell has supported Toronto Rehab and a whole host of organizations, hundreds of organizations across our country on this cause. But it's important and it's special for another reason. Um, we have invited uh, a special moderator to join us here today. And um, she's even more beautiful <laughs> in person than she is on, on camera. It's um, the fabulous Tracy Melshore. Please round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Tracy, uh, as everyone knows, uh, is a TV, a TV celebrity uh, personality and uh, is senior correspondent with CTV's E-Talk. E e yes. And special moderator here mm -hmm. at Toronto Rehab on Bell Let's Talk And Day. Bell Let's Talk Day. I'm so excited to be here, Cindy, on Bell Let's Talk Day. It is a privilege to have you, and uh, I'm going to be quiet now okay. and let you get to it. Well, you did an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. You know, Bell Let's Talk Day is important for so many reasons. Um, it's important because it raises awareness, it's important because it raises money, but um, to personalize it, uh, a few years ago, Bell Let's Talk Day, and I would say if it was a Jackie Collins novel, it would be, I would say that I had a nervous breakdown. And so I couldn't imagine a few years ago being here in front of you speaking um, and moderating a panel with such distinguished uh, panelists. So um, thank you for welcoming me, and uh, I will get back to business. Uh, 
We're going to be joined today by Dr. Abraham Snyderman. Hello, Dr. Snyderman. And, <laughs> and Dr. Martha McKay. Hi, Dr. Martha McKay of Toronto Rehab. And we're going to talk about an important topic affecting many of us, anxiety and depression. So we know the numbers. Mental health affects Canadians of all ages and from all walks of life. One in five of us, I feel like that number is low, but I'm not a doctor. One in five of us will be touched by mental illness uh, sometime in our lifetime. So and that's why it's so important that we're here at Bell Let's Talk Day. We're going to raise awareness. We're going to raise funds. While I'm speaking right now, I don't mind if you send a text and say hashtag Bell Let's Talk to your best friend, to your love, whatever. Honestly, I won't be offended. So today's webinar is very interactive. We have a conversation and question and answer period following Dr. Snyderman's presentation. And for those of you viewing online, like Cindy said, we encourage you to type in your questions now and send them to trf at uhn.ca. If we hashtag Bell Let's Talk on that too, that'll work, right? Yeah, do that too. Okay, so, and for those of you here in the audience, welcome. Hope you're comfortable, you had a nice little lunch and everything is good. So uh, we're going to encourage you, you're going to have an opportunity to ask questions directly of Dr. Snyderman and Dr. McKay. So it is now my pleasure to introduce you to today's presenter. Dr. Abe Snyderman is a neuropsychiatrist and director of the Neuropsychiatry Clinic in Toronto's Rehab's Neuro Rehabilitation Program where he's worked for the past 24 years. He's a clinician teacher in the departments of psychiatry and medicine at the University of Toronto and is nationally sought as a keynote speaker and lecturer. His expertise is in the cognitive, emotional, and behavioral effects of neurological problems such as multiple sclerosis, stroke, severe traumatic brain injury, and seizure disorders. Please welcome Dr. Snyderman. All right, so how do we top that one? Okay, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure being here talking about depression, anxiety, and the brain. Uh, I have to uh, do a disclosure uh, slide. I have no conflict of interest. I'm not affiliated with any form of industry or sponsored by anyone. I will be talking about medication, but I have no affiliation with any pharmaceutical company. This presentation is meant as a brief educational exercise and not a medical consultation or treatment advice. As always, listen to your healthcare provider, follow their advice, as I don't know you guys. Please follow um, their instructions, they'll be able to guide you. I have 20 minutes and so much material. By definition, I'm gonna be jumping slides all the time, so my apologies for that. This is a presentation geared towards the general public to teach a little bit about the concepts of mood and anxiety. So since I have very little time, I thought let's start with the 17th century. <laughs> you listen and you hear that music. We're all gathered today. Actually, this is Tomas Luis de Victoria, Obus Omnes. And in his day in the 17th century, he would have been by Beyonce, uh, Billy Joel, Elton John all together. If there was an iPod, everybody would be listening to this thing. And it is conceivable, that is possible. Okay, enough of that already. Thank you. It is possible that this guy on the 17th century, while he was a soldier, this guy might have heard, if he had an iPod, he might have been listening to this type of music while he was lying on the cot and looking at the ceiling. And the ceiling was a ceiling that was grid. It was a grid like this, it were squares. And in one of the squares, legend goes, he saw a spider or a fly. And he started thinking, well, if I count one, two, three, four left, one, two, three, four up, I can actually tell people where exactly though that fly is. So we call that the coordinates. So he invented this process and it kind of caught on in science. He also was a philosopher who did Principia Philosophica, and in it, he said, cogito ergo sum in Latin, which means, I think, therefore I am. Some of you might know who this is. He also said that brain is different than mind, in a school of thought that's called dualism. Now, by now, you probably know this is Rene Descartes, who lived from 1596 to 1650, and he was one of the founders of the school of thought called the Rationalist. However, here I am in Toronto in the 21st century telling 
that dualism minus different is actually wrong. Because now we know that the mental properties is one of the functions of the brain. So the purposes of this, for the purposes of this presentation, mind equals brain, please. And there's the proof. <laughs> That's me on Friday nights. So for all intents and purposes, we divide the brain, and this is not a neuroanatomy class, don't panic, but we divide the brain according to the type of cells it has in certain functional divisions. So the frontal lobe, can you see the cursor there? Yes. The frontal lobe is the largest part of the brain, and it's a manager of the brain. It's what makes us human. Parietal lobe deals with sensory sensation and motor and other functions. Occipital lobe is vision. Temporal lobe has a whole bunch of functions, including emotion, memory, attention. So for the purposes of the presentation, we're gonna talk about the thinking brain, the neocortex. It's called neon, neo because in the evolution of species, that's the latest in the evolution. It's a new brain. The emotional part is further deep. This is, a, the reptile brain is underneath, and that's a survival, that's your automatic pilot. So a little perspective from Stats Canada. This comes straight from the website, from the website of Stats Canada, and it points out the homicides between 2012 and 2016, every one of them a tragedy. 400 people are killed in this country every year, a tragedy, which pales in comparison to suicides. 4,000 people kill themselves every year. 11,000 people die in accidents. So this is at least 11 times more than homicides, 30 times more uh, than homicides, accidents, and yet we don't hear about it in the media. We hear about the shootings. I understand why, but we don't hear about the tragedies that go on every single day. 4,000 people a year. Why do we not hear about it? Stigma. Stigma is defined as a mark of disgrace, which is associated with a particular circumstance, quality, or person. My friend, stigma kills. I've, see, I've been doing this for many, many years, and if there's something that has killed patients, it's not attending to treatment early enough, not talking about it because of stigma. One in five, as Tracy said, in Canada will have um, a mental illness, and at any given time, 10% of us will have a mental illness. It is a tragedy when you realize that the percentage of adolescents between 15 and 24 that report mental illness or substance use is almost 20%, and 90% of the people who kill themselves will have a diagnosis of a mental illness. And you tell me, what's with the other 10%? Very different reasons why people kill themselves, not necessarily because of mental illness, especially now in the medical-assisted death. Percentage of Canadians who will experience in their lifetime depression, 8%. It doesn't sound like a lot until you realize that 8% is 2.4 million people in Canada. 1% suffer bipolar, 300,000. Anxiety, 3.6 million. And those are the ones that we know about. Those are the ones that race to the threshold of being identified because they reached out. Who knows how many thousands or millions are there that suffer in silence. Perspective. When I started my career back in the day when mammoths and uh, Neanderthals roamed the earth, <laughs> no, <laughs> hey, this is, this is okay. No woman would, would uh, talk out loud about a diagnosis of breast cancer. In the 1970s, that was stigmatized. Same with colon, same with prostate, same with cervical cancer. And now we talk about it. There's campaigns. The media covers it. Fantastic. And yet, it's almost the same as the number of people who suffer from anxiety, and we don't hear about it. Highest rest of depression symptoms under the, under 20 years of age. This is a tragedy, and it's getting worse. It might be because there's more access to substance, uh, substance use um, or other uh, aspects that I don't have time to discuss. The cost of caring for somebody in the community is almost $35,000 a year, which you say this is tremendous cost. And yet, if they have to be in hospital for the same amount of time, is 170,000. And this is a bit of an old statistic. So when is depression an illness and when is anxiety a normal reaction? Let's talk about medicine. I'm going to do a Wizard of Oz and uncover what's behind the curtain here. So symptom is a subjective health complaint 
something you tell me. As a patient, you tell me. Sign is something I, as a physician, observe. So, for example, tremors, sweating, restlessness. And a syndrome is when we put together signs and symptoms and we make them into a particular syndrome, like panic attacks or sleep apnea. So symptoms plus signs equals syndrome. Let me give you an example. So when we have several syndromes, now we have a disease. So cough plus fever plus chills, chances are you have pneumonia. And you're going to say cough and fever are symptoms. But they also happen in many illnesses, so they could be syndrome too. So let me give you another example, see if you can guess it. Sighing, distractibility, butterflies in the stomach. What do you think it is? No, you're in love. <laughs> so come on, guys. Let's not medicalize the whole thing, right? <laughs> so what makes us sad? Universal topics I see in my clinic are helplessness, guilt, loneliness, pain, hopelessness, isolation, but the worst of it, certain hockey team lack of championship win. <laughs> I will not say which one. So what is a mood disorder? What is normal mood? What's a mood disorder? What's normal sadness? What's a mood disorder? The symptoms of a mood disorder, whether it's depression or mania, have to be new or noticeably worse than baseline. Most of the day, they have to have them nearly every day for at least two consecutive weeks. And perhaps the most important one, it has to have significant distress or impaired functioning. If your functioning is not impaired, you don't have a disease. So we divide them in two, major depressive disorder and bipolar. Let's talk of major depressive disorders. There's seven or eight of them, and they keep on increasing as research goes on. The more common ones are major depressive disorder, persistent depressive disorder or dysthymia, that's a chronic depression, depressive disorder due to a medical condition, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, we don't call it PMS anymore, substance or medication-induced depressive disorder, and a newer one, disruptive mood dysregulation syndrome. The most common one would be major depressive. So what are the symptoms? What are the signs of depression? We divide them in emotional, cognitive, and behavioral. For example, emotional symptoms, constant sadness, feelings of worthlessness, or excessive or inappropriate guilt. What I've observed in my clinic is that guilt and shame are the killers. When a patient says, what's the point of being alive? I'm a burden to my family. Or even worse, my family would be better off without me. That's a red flag. And so I very subtly put it in red and highlighted in yellow. Suicidal thoughts. There's a popular concept that if you ask somebody about suicide, you just implanted the thought in their heads, and they're going to kill themselves, and it's going to be your fault. The research shows the opposite. The more you ask about it, the more you talk about it, the more relief people feel. Physical symptoms, low energy, Psychomotor impairment means you're feeling slow, aches and pains, insomnia or the opposite, change in weight, and low or absent sex drive. Behavioral, you have no appetite, you have apathy or you feel restless, you have difficulty making decisions, problems with attention and memory. So I'm going to talk very briefly about medications. There's old antidepressants and new antidepressants. The older ones work as well as the newer ones, but the side effects are much worse. So that's why we stop using them. And the newer ones, are the ones listed there, fluoxetine, certainly, citalopram, citalopram, venlafaxine. There's many, many more, which I don't have time to talk about. All of them take four to six weeks before they become effective. This is important because oftentimes I hear patients telling me, I was on X medication, took it for three weeks, got some side effects, didn't work, I stopped it, which is a shame because the medication was just halfway through the time when it starts working. They are amongst the most widely used worldwide uh, medications with a proven safety record. My colleagues in oncology laugh at me when I say what type of side effects my medications have, and I explain to them, and they just laugh at me because their medications are way, way tougher. Side effects are diverse. What is a side effect for one patient might not be a side effect for the next one. A medication might be good for one patient and terrible for the next one. So let's move to the biological. This is uh, Hieronymus Bosch in circa 1494, and he's extracting the stone of madness. In reality, what was probably happening is that this poor guy there had a fall and had a bleed that needed to be evacuated. It was called a uh, trypanostomy. So this is the surgeon, which was a barber. I don't know why the funnel must be the fashion of the day or just to pick up the blood. 
Um, it helps that the patient is restrained. Uh, this would be the anesthetist with the likely wine zonking the patient out. But this, uh, this got to be Wikipedia. <laughs> so this is to show you how barbaric surgical treatment was back then. We in the mental health field, we are starting our journey. Our colleagues in surgery, our colleagues in medicine have had a long head start. So what they saw as barbaric was state of the art. The same goes for electrical stimulation. Electroconvulsive therapy is the fastest, safest treatment for severe life-threatening depression. One flu over the cuckoo's nest did a terrible disservice to mental health because it stigmatized a very effective treatment. The way you see it in the movie, that's 1950s. That's the guy cutting the head to get the madness stone out. The way we do it now is under anesthesia with muscle relaxation and oxygenation, the patient doesn't feel anything. There's temporary memory disruption around the time of ECT, but there's been decades of research trying to prove whether ECT causes brain damage. There's absolutely no evidence. Newer treatments are repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation in which we put a magnet that stimulates certain areas through magnetic energy. And that's actually coming along quite nicely and has become the treatment of choice in treatment resistant depression, for patients that do not respond to antidepressants. The psychotherapies, cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness have become very common these days, interpersonal, individual or group social networks, family involvement. This particular book by Padesky and Greenberg is very useful. And something that has been grossly underutilized and researched is exercise. Regular exercise helps mood, sleep, and energy. It's underutilized. Frequency is the most important factor, not so much uh, what type of exercise. 10-minute walk might be as good as a 45-minute walk. Uh, the, the rule of 5 times 30, jog, walk, bike, or dance, whatever you want to do, 3 to 5 times a week for 30 minutes. Some web-based treatment, mood effects is something put out by the Mood Center, Mood Disorder Center at UBC. There's lots of, lots of web-based. So let's talk about bipolar. This is the opposite of depression. This is elevated mania with elevated mood with irritability, has to last a week, inflated self-esteem, decreased need for sleep. These are patients who have tons of energy, don't sleep, tons and tons of energy, start getting into trouble, poor attention, pleasure seeking. Hypomania is less of an evil cousin, the lesser of the two. It's high mood, but not to the point of uh, mania. There's three types of bipolarity. When patients tell me, doctor, you have to help me, I have mood swings. What we mean by mood swing is this. You go from normal mood to very high mood and back to very low mood. What patients often mean is that we have normal mood and then we go down and we come back up and it feels like a swing, but it's actually not. The first line of treatment is medication for bipolar mood disorders and lithium anticonvulsants and some antipsychotics. Psychoeducation is crucial. The family and the patient needs to know about it. I'm running out of time, so I have to run. Things that make us anxious, death, illness, money, relationships, work, exams, certain hockey team, lack of championship win. <laughs> I cry at night, he says. Anxiety disorders, what are we talking about? If you see this guy, would you be scared? Eh, not really, but he's a lion. What about if this guy was coming at you? Eh, kind of, although the flies must be more bothersome to the poor lioness. But the worst of the images I could find was this one, <laughs> especially yesterday. For those of you listening elsewhere in Ontario, the Gardiner is one of the major highways in Toronto. Anxiety disorders, again, for a disorder has to be new, must be noticeably worse um, if it's not a new symptom, most of the day, nearly every day, and causing impaired functioning. What are the disorders? General anxiety disorder, these are people who worry all the time. Panic disorder, burst of severe anxiety bordering on terror with lots of physical symptoms. Agoraphobia, the fear of being in a situation in which you cannot easily escape or staying home. Post-traumatic stress disorder, probably most of you will hear about it. Exposure to a traumatic event that leaves afterwards lots of problems. I don't have time to get into it. Social anxiety disorder or social phobia, performance anxiety, public speaking, um, that kind of thing. Simple phobia is the most common one, heights, snakes, spiders. 
obsessive compulsive disorder. Anxiety disorders are very common. Up to 31% will have in, a, in their lifetime an anxiety disorder, underdiagnosed, undertreated, underfunded. What are general screening questions for anxiety disorder? During the past two weeks, how much have you been bothered by the following problems? Feeling nervous, anxious, frightened, worried, or on edge, feeling panic or frightened, and avoiding situations. What are the risk factors? If you have a family or personal history of mood or anxiety disorders, you're more at risk of having an anxiety disorder yourself. For some reason, women have a higher prevalence rate of uh, anxiety and depression too. It might be that they're more keen on seeking help. It, it might be that they're more identifiable. Um, all ages, loneliness, low education and adverse parenting are risk factors as are having chromatic, uh, chronic, sorry, I just got, chronic somatic illness. Substance and mood disorders coexist. What are the symptoms? Something is going to go wrong. This worry is gonna make me nuts. I need to be sure nothing bad is going to happen. And muscle tension, feeling keyed up, restless, irritable, sleep disturbance. Behavioral symptoms include avoidance, restricting involvement in activities, excessive reassurance seeking, or over preparing for a webcast slash presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Happens. The treatment for anxiety disorders is mostly based on psychotherapies and medications, but our first line is medications, particularly cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness, virtual reality exposure therapy is very useful, and again, exercise. What do we try to treat? In anxiety, as in depression, the patient will have negative thoughts, negative attitudes, negative beliefs. We try to help the patient identify those, question their validity, and change them. In terms of medications, antidepressants are usually the first line to treat anxiety disorders. They work in the same areas of the brain. And my particular bias is to avoid PAM, not the spray, but lorazepam, diazepam, clonazepam, nitrazepam, alprazolam, if possible. Some patients need them, nothing wrong with that. But if possible, not the first choice. There are some apps like MindShift that will help patients with anxiety. So how does a brain injury affect emotions, behavior, and thoughts? Planning, goal setting, self-assessment, behavioral initiation, behavioral inhibition are all frontal lobe functions. This is what makes us human. So how is this still a thing? Why is a sport where the purpose is to give the other person a brain injury still a legal sport beyond me? So what happens when we injure our brain? This is a parabolic antenna, and you see how it is concave. And the concavity basically makes the energy come down and reflect. And if we use the X and Y axis, that, fine, the card was right in that one. So we can see how the energy focuses in a certain point. This is exactly what happens in a brain injury. The concavity, if you think of your skull as an uh, inverted parabolic antenna, when you hit your head, you have energy traveling downstream to the areas of the brain in the center of the brain where they amplify. Unfortunately, this is the area where all the um, neurotransmitters that help with your mood and many other functions get manufactured and then sent upstream to the rest of the brain. So if that area is affected, you're gonna have anxiety, you're gonna have mood problems. So in order to help you understand, let me bring my assistant. This is somebody I bring every session. Could you please help us understand the parts of the frontal lobe, please? Yeah, sure. This is the orbitofrontal, this is the dorsolateral, this is the ventromedial, and this is the anterior cingulate. Thanks, dude. I'll see you later. Yeah, no problem. See you later. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, this is the... <laughs> I have to show that one. This is the part where I explain why we know that mind equals brain. We know from studies and from observations for many centuries that if you hit certain parts of your brain, you have certain problems. So if you hit this part of the brain, the dorsolateral prefrontal syndrome, you're gonna look depressed. You're gonna be slow, you're gonna be inattentive, you're gonna have lots of problems moving, organizing, you're passive. While if you hit this part on top of your eyes, you're gonna have in the middle of the two uh, hemispheres, you're gonna be apathetic. You're gonna be very slow, very hard to treat. And if you hit this part of the brain on top of your eyes, you're gonna have behavioral excess. 
impulsivity, liability, psychomotor, hyperactivity, aggression, poor inhibition, uh, teenager. <laughs> but some people have all three, dorsolateral, ventromedial, orbitofrontal, and they look something like this. Brain is mind, but we're we are more than electrochemical reactions. So when a patient comes to my clinic, I look at them as having biological, their body problems, psychological issues, and social issues. And when I put them together in predisposing, what does the patient bring to my session? Who is this human being? What precipitated the illness that he's presenting with? What's perpetuating the symptoms? And what protects the patient? So let's say we have a patient that is hypothyroid, has a genetic predisposition, uses some marijuana, is perfectionistic, has financial pressures, then gets involved in a motor vehicle accident, has a brain injury, now has pain, fatigue, dizziness in biological, psychological, she feels or he feels vulnerable, uncertain, and anger. This is actually a real case. Uh, in financial, she cannot work, she has financial losses. What's perpetuating her symptoms is pain, fatigue, dizziness, sensory changes, insomnia, the use of marijuana doesn't help either. So they have anxiety and all of this that you can read. Unfortunately, I'm running out of time. I'm getting all sorts of messages. So what are protective? Intelligence, she's young. She, has, she was healthy before. She had the thyroid that she takes and is resilient. So if we put all this in blue together, we have the signs, we have the symptoms, and we have two syndromes, anxiety and depression. And we're gonna use the protective aspects to help this patient understand the symptoms, validate the complaints, accept her symptoms, regain control, and reintegrate into the community. So my take home points, brain equals mind, stigma kills, brain-based disorders affecting cognitions, behavior, and emotional well-being are major depressive, major depressive disorders, bipolar mood and anxiety disorders. They are grossly underfunded and lots of barriers to access. They are common cause of disability and death they are treatable chronic conditions and they're effective treatments. Brain injury equals increased risk of depression and anxiety. Don't suffer in silence. So my final three slides. We talked about symptom, sign, and syndrome, and I showed you three syndromes that cause a disease, and we talk about them being love. So I'm conscious that we're about to enter February, so I decided to put together a playlist for the cautious, let's not say anxious. So, for example, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Heart Club Band, uh, Misery Loves Company. <laughs> Don't Go Breaking My Heart, Anticipatory Anxiety, Total Eclipse of the Heart, Catastrophic Thinking. <laughs> I'm going to spoil these songs for you guys, sorry. Stop Dragging My Head Around, Passion, Assertiveness, High Blood Pressure. Kiss my heart. But this song, when I heard it as I researched this, I thought, I got to use this song because what if rather than having our feelings in our heart, the only feeling you have in your heart is when this artery blocks and then you have a heart attack because most of the emotions are processed in the brain. So we're really going to spoil the songs for you. We're going to go harder brain. So how about if we go Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Brain Club Band, Intellectual Misery Loves Company, don't go breaking my brain. What all pro sport leagues should be applying to the players. Total eclipse of the brain. Monday at 6 a.m. Stop dragging my brain around. This is a public service announcement to first year college and university students. And my brain has a mind of its own. Sorry, the card, you're still wrong. Thank you. Thank and you. I went way over time, apologies. Thank you, Dr. Schneiderman, for an incredible, informative talk on anxiety and depression. Thank you. Uh, can I say um, maybe the song I would have is I Left My Brain in San Francisco? Oh, uh, yes. But then, I, yeah, yeah, you no? leave your brain in San Francisco, you must have had a great time. Oh, there you go. <laughs>
Or is that Vegas? Sorry. Yeah, oh, well, <laughs> what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. in Vegas. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. My pleasure. As part of our today's expert panel, I'd like to reintroduce you to Dr. Martha McKay, a staff psychologist in the Spinal Cord Rehab Program at Toronto Rehab's Lindhurst Center. Welcome, Dr. McKay. Thank you. Come here. So, you know, it, it's Bell Let's Talk Day. I'm, you know, it's, we're talking about anxiety and depression. Uh, and I'm joyful to be here speaking about that. But is anxiety always a negative? Do I always have to speak about it, like, in a negative term? Not necessarily. Um, I'm going to take this one. Yeah. Fire ahead. <laughs> the presentation so, just got better. <laughs> So anxiety doesn't necessarily always have to be a bad thing. It can alert us to danger and, and it can motivate us, you know, to prepare for presentations and to, and to uh, you know, search the environment for any dangers. So in healthy, appropriate amounts, anxiety can be a good thing that keeps us safe and motivates us. When it becomes an issue, and I think Dr. Snyderman, you alluded to some of these things as well, um, is when it's, it's too much. Mm -hmm. um, it's interfering with what it is we'd like to do. It is overwhelming us. Um, it, it, and again, it's impairing our everyday function. So in some of the individuals that we would see here at Toronto Rehab, anxiety can be a good thing in their therapies that can keep them safe if mm -hmm. they're thinking of you know, uh, um, things that can impact their safety. Uh, but when it's overwhelming, it can interfere with their therapy. So it can prevent them from trying something that we've reassured them is safe and all that sort of stuff. So again, it can be protective in the sense of, of safety and motivation. But when it's too much, it can prevent us from doing the things we want to do. OK. Thank you so much. I want to remind everybody in the room that we're going to ask you for questions. And uh, we have the address if you want to send in your questions. And thank you, Arlene. Oh, we have some. Uh, so Arlene has a question. Are there certain individuals who are more vulnerable to depression and anxiety? Oh, okay, me. <laughs> <laughs> no, not you being the vulnerable to depression. No, yeah. right. <laughs> but you know, as you said, a woman, yes. Mm -hmm. I, uh, so we do know that there are certain individuals who can be more vulnerable to depression and anxiety, and you covered some of them as well. Uh, you know, one of the disturbing trends that we're seeing is with youth. Uh, it is on the rise, so that is concerning uh, to a lot of us in the mental health profession. Um, individuals who have a family history, so they may have a genetic predisposition to depression and anxiety. Um, individuals who have had early childhood adversity or stressful life events, we do know there is that connection between stress and depression and anxiety, so um, that can occur for individuals who have either, uh, like I said, early childhood uh, stressful life events or um, chronic stress as well. Okay. We have another question somebody uh, sent in. How can family members uh, help support a person suffering with a mental health diagnosis? Uh, if I can take this one, <laughs> it's crucial. The first issue that we have to understand is that when somebody feels anxious, when somebody feels depressed, the last thing they want to do is talk about what they're feeling. There's the issue of shame. There's the issue of stigma. They don't want to be seen as weak. They want to become a burden, and that's the killer. So they start sinking deeper and deeper, and then the silence of stigma um, creates a barrier. So oftentimes, families are absolutely not aware that there's a problem. They see that the person is irritable or moody or fatigued, but they just think that's the way they are, or they're not feeling well physically, when in fact what they might be having is anxiety or depression. Number one is education. If the patient or the person suffering from this problem is able to say something, to express something to somebody anywhere, you start breaking the cycle. You start opening barriers. You start basically opening avenues for treatment, avenues for disclosure, avenues for normalization. Oftentimes, you'll hear somebody say, well, I'm very anxious about presenting. And everybody says, yes, me too. Yeah. <laughs> I have another slide in another presentation. And I show spiders. And I say, is anybody here afraid of spiders? Nobody raises their hand. And then I show the slide, and everybody goes, Ugh. Everybody has them. But they don't talk about it. So for family to understand what their loved one is going through is absolutely crucial. And for us as professionals to educate as to what is going on. This is a neurological condition. This is a brain disease. We are more than just a bag of chemicals. 
our environment, our genes, our loved ones all come together into both creating stress but also helping us pull out of stress. It, it sounds like I'm, I'm making light of it, but you mentioned teenagers briefly in your presentation. So how do we as parents identify you know, um, a clinical a possible diagnosis with teenage behavior? You have to understand that a teenager, and I mean this in the... I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> I have another friend like that. Okay, all right. Um, you have to understand, and I mean this in the best possible way, a teenager is an incomplete human. Their brains have not yet matured. So what you're seeing, remember I show you in the frontal lobes that they can be temperamental, they can be irritable. Their sleep cycle moves forward. Hormones start happening at a different time. Lots of issues about self-image. So cut them a bit of a slack and ask the questions. Are you angry? Are you tired? Are you sad? No, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. no, you don't sound okay. Are you okay? Open the avenue, but realize, cut them some slack. They're really struggling with changes in the body. You might have somebody six feet tall that is 13 years of age. So we expect certain things and they cannot really process yet. Having said that, they have the passion and they have the energy, they have the humor and their brain are so plastic, they learn immediately stuff that I wish I could learn that mm -hmm. stuff that quickly. Mm -hmm. So they're both positives. We have to enhance the positives, understand the negatives, and get them to sleep as early as you can. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the friend. <laughs> uh, we have another uh, question that was sent in. Do you see a future for, I believe you addressed it too, um, uh, Dr. Snyderman, for a psychedelic therapy? Right for the treatment of depression <laughs> and anxiety in Canada? Okay, there is a very interesting development. Um, <clears throat> those of us of a certain age would remember LSD, and if you don't remember, it means that you were there. <laughs> um, some psychedelics, when used in different ways in the lab, this is still research, might enhance mood. For example, there's a lot of interest in a medication called ketamine, which is an anesthetic, that's not as an anesthetic but it, it's been helping patients with treatment-resistant depression. Now, lots of issues, don't go out buying LSD, say I'm mm -hmm. going to treat my depression and <laughs> Dr. Snyder said. No, 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 I, no, 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 no. <laughs> This is all experimental. Mm -hmm. So the one problem with psychedelics, and psychedelics, strictly speaking, means something that affects the mind, is, for example, cannabinoids. They're legal now, but doesn't mean that they're necessarily helpful for the brain. We know there's lots of research showing that using cannabinoids will increase levels of apathy, decrease motivation, affect how your brain processes information. So the typical image of somebody that's stoned in the basement eating pizza at 45 is because they actually have no energy, they have no motivation, they have no drive, and over time, though it might relieve anxiety and improve some symptoms of depression, over time use actually causes more of these problems. So us in the neurosciences are not exactly thrilled about this sort of new development. Um, it is what it is. Okay, thank you. Uh, want to open it up to the floor? What is the role of sleep and anxiety? No, you can okay. do that. <laughs> Crucial. Um, <laughs> sleep is one of my favorite topics not sleeping necessarily, but actually reading about it. Um, during sleep, several things happen. You would think that your brain is at its lowest, and it, yet in many, are, many areas, it is most active. Lots of proteins being formed, lots of garbage, if you wish, being recycled out of the brain during certain stages of sleep. When you go into a cycle of insomnia, you're not clearing your brain, you're not resting. That makes you irritable, that makes you impatient. It doesn't allow you to form new memories and encode new memories in the memory filing system. Um, you feel you're not doing a good job, you feel tired, you can't pay attention. Um, recently I saw on TV a series about sleep issues and they were interviewing teenagers and how they're chronically sleep deprived. So that starts enhancing the cycle of fatigue, irritability, failure in class or failure at work, 
feeling like a failure, more stress, less sleep, and you start the cycle. Now, rather than going for sleeping pills as a first choice, guess what I'm going to recommend? Exercise. Mm -hmm. Exercise. You start very slow and you gradually increase it, you're going to start sleeping better, assuming you don't have a primary sleep disorder. And for that, you need to be seen as a sleep, at a sleep disorders clinic. But in the vast majority of people, exercise will help solve uh, some of these issues. Hi. Um, which antidepressant is better, and can you become addicted? Uh, very good question. That's perhaps one of the main questions I get in the office. A, you cannot get addicted to something that takes four weeks to kick in. So imagine taking a pill, waiting for the high for four and a half weeks. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, not happening. The way antidepressants work is very different than the way drug of abuse like cocaine and heroin behave. Uh, so no, you cannot get addicted to antidepressants. Many people who use substances, they actually self-treating a mood or an anxiety disorder. Um, which antidepressant is the best? That's an easy question. The one that the patient responds to. There is no one particular agent. There's no gold standard. Imipramine, the first antidepressant, remains one of the best antidepressants. Unfortunately, the side effects are very difficult to tolerate, so the newer generation came about and with much less side effects. So the problem with the brain, in a way, is that each patient will have a different response. Uh, one patient will respond to agent one, and patient number two will hate agent one and say that they cannot tolerate the side effects. It's horrible. And yet a third patient might say, yeah, I didn't respond to either. So it's trial and error, unfortunately. We don't have the luxury that my colleagues in surgery or general medicine have in which if there's a liver problem, they go in with a needle. Nobody wants to give me a piece of the brain while they're still alive for us to see what are you responding. Now, there are new strategies in genetics to try to elucidate particular response to certain agents. So there are blood tests coming online uh, that are useful in determining whether you're going to respond or not to certain agents. Long answer to a short question, but that's that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, we have a question that says, what asks, what can be done to increase awareness in our community about the high rates of suicide? And that, those numbers that you t spoke about as compared to accidents, it's frightening. It, it, everybody in this room will know somebody who killed themselves or of somebody who killed themselves, everyone. Nobody talks about it. Mm -hmm. Nobody talks about it. It's a sin. In some, in some cultures, it's considered a major sin. So nobody wants to be associated with it. Nobody has to talk about it. Um, from what I've seen, it's devastating. So it's, again, one brain, one death, and 10 people affected mm -hmm. immediately. There's nothing as hard as losing somebody by suicide. We need to talk about it. It's there. It's 10 times the numbers of homicides. I'm not making light of the homicides. It's horrendous. But this is 10 times, and we don't hear about it. We don't get coverage in the media about it. Mm -hmm. We hear the ones that are politically motivated. We hear the ones that are horrendously impactful on society. But we don't hear of the epidemic. And with the same with accidents. This hospital is full of people who have sustained accidents and stop being able to function, life-altering accidents, we don't hear a thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Same with spinal cord. I agree, yeah. 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 But even in, it's funny, not funny, but I, ironic you say that because in, when I was in journalism school, though, that was one of the mandates we spoke about. You know, we don't speak about suicides and, mm -hmm. you know, because of how it affects their families and, and, you know, and religion, and, but that's, and something that has to be changed. It has, has to be changed. Sure. When I started med school, a woman will not talk about cervical cancer. And they were dying by the thousands. A woman would not talk about breast cancer. And the mortality was horrendous. Now we have no problem mm -hmm. advertising the vaccine for cervical cancer, get them all, and getting screening programs for breast cancer. So we got to get there. You know, and on Let's Talk Day, it's a perfect example mm -hmm. of why campaigns like this are very important to talk about uh, issues like this because, yeah, we need to talk about them. 
to save lives. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, okay, we have, um, this is a question that I think that comes up a lot. What are some of the barriers to treatment? Because, you know, you've, you've opened up, you've spoken to somebody, you've shared your experience, and now you want to get help. Okay. <laughs> I'll that, that, that was a big question, yes, it, but it's an important question. There are barriers to treatment. Our healthcare system, uh, the demand uh, for mental health services, we just can't keep up with it. Um, there are services, though, and there are programs. However, barriers might be uh, a long wait list to get mm. into that program. Um, they may not fully offer all the services that you might require, so maybe it's a consultative uh, service rather than something that offers intervention. Um, maybe it's group intervention and you were looking for more individualized uh, intervention. Sometimes it's location too. Exactly. Sometimes it's location, uh, accessibility. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, there are a lot of barriers. I, I think, you know, the demand is there uh, and we try to keep up with the demand, but it is, it is very great and it's difficult to do so. If you have to go through the public system, you're gonna wait a long, long, long time. Even worse, if you have a child that has mental health needs, or if you have uh, particular disorders like spinal cord, mm -hmm. brain injury, mm -hmm. stroke, MS, the resources are even less. Mm -hmm. There are huge waiting lists. Uh, private care is available, but it's very expensive. So if you don't have insurance, it is very difficult to access. It is a crisis. We're talking, the World Health Organization predicted years ago that by next year, depression is gonna be the number two cause of disability worldwide. Yeah. Number one is cardiovascular disease. Yeah. And yet we're not allocating the, the resource. I understand governments have a certain pool of money, tons of issues in healthcare, tons of critical issues, but this is an epidemic. That's a staggering. Can you say that again? So by next year, depression is going to be the number two. The World yep. Health Organization years yep. back did an analysis and predicted by, by 2020, 20. depression is going to be the number two cause of disability worldwide. This is not in Canada. This is worldwide. It's not that we're diagnosing it more. It's just that people are more easily identifiable, but it's becoming, a, an, for some reason that I'm not aware of, it's becoming a huge problem worldwide. We have another a question that you, you spoke about cannabinoids. Cannabinoids, I did never say it like that. Cannabis. Canna okay, there you go. Marijuana. So is marijuana <laughs> useful for anxiety or depression? Uh, useful for whom? <laughs> I'm just reading the question. <laughs> um, the seller is very useful. Yeah. yeah. Um, there, we still, I guess in the next five to 10 years, we're gonna have a lot of material to study since now it's legal and we have a pool of, of people that are going to acknowledge using it so we can study them. Uh, what we see, what I and my colleagues see is that it might numb some of the symptoms very much like alcohol might, mm -hmm. but sorrow floats. So if you want to drown your, your sorrows in alcohol, they're gonna float up. Same with cannabinoids. It might help in certain conditions of chronic pain, uh, spasticity in patients with neurological disorders, but for strictly speaking anxiety and depression, we don't get very good results. I always tell my patients, uh, if you want to smoke uh, marijuana or, or eat it, we're gonna have a heck of a time stabilizing your mood. And that's just, Science, that's just reality. Say it louder for the people in the back, okay. <laughs> um, this question just came in. Thank you, Arlene. Um, as a mother of a teen who attempted suicide eight years later, I'm still terrified that they may do it. Uh, as a parent of a now an adult, how do I make sure that they're doing okay? So, twofold. Oof. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, that is, a, that is a difficult thing for any parent to, to go through. I think one of the important things that we keep highlighting is to talk about it. So to not talk about it doesn't allow an individual to be able to express. Uh, sometimes when individuals are at that point where they're going to 
harm themselves, they are scared um, in some cases, and, and, and being able to speak about it um, could be helpful. Um. It, is, it is very hard. One of the most frustrating aspects as a clinician, as a neuropsychiatrist, is having to tell people that if they want to kill themselves and they really mean it, I don't read minds unless they talk about it, unless they open up, unless they tell me what's going on. I cannot help them, and I'm a professional. For family members, the fear, the trauma of having gone through a suicide, whether it's completed or not completed, never leaves. Mm -hmm. So they're always gonna be the stress, either, are they gonna do it, are they mm -hmm. gonna do it? Yeah. There's constant monitoring, are you feeling like killing yourself? Are you feeling hopeless? Are you feeling a sense of increased guilt? Are you ashamed of something? And one of the problems is that substance use um, doesn't help. Because if somebody is, for example, very depressed, having suicidal thoughts, but still has the capacity to refrain from it, and then they become intoxicated and they become disinhibited and lose that capacity to refrain, that's when they might do it. Uh, men's Men, w women attempt suicide more than men, but men succeed more because of the means they use. They typically, men use more violent ways that ensure mm -hmm. death. Um, can happen at any age mm -hmm. and has to be inquired. So if that person, I'm terribly sorry that person went through mm -hmm. this, is horrendous. Uh, there has to be some follow up with professional care for this person. Uh, are, I mean, on, on table that, and I you know, <coughs> what about social media when it comes to anxiety and depression? Like, I know when I took my, my, my time off um, to handle myself, and I, one of my, my psychiatrists, my, sorry, my um, psychologist, so many, so many doctors, uh, my, psychi my psychologist said that I should just take off, get off social media. That should be part of my wellness plan. But that's my wellness plan, right? During that time when I was. So I, I think social media can be helpful in certain situations. So perhaps in some situations it's not helpful for people. Uh, social media can, you know, raise awareness through campaigns such like mm -hmm. today. Uh, however, on an individual level, I, I think we're starting to see that there can be some negative effects of social media. And so, you know, not always scrolling and seeing what you're missing out on and what's happening, um, you know, that can be detrimental for some people. So. Uh, it's an individual thing, mm -hmm. I would say, and for some people it can be very helpful and supportive depending on how they're using it. And as a mother of, of teenagers, I know that, okay, um, I, I won't use it as my personal thing, but I know as a mother of teenagers when you talk about sleep and you talk about social media and it's, you know, I have to go in and like take everybody's devices and go into routers and shut down Wi-Fi, you know, like, because just to make sure that everybody is closing their eyes at some point and having, and going to sleep. Not a doctor, but that's what I do. <laughs> right. I do the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah right, it, it's, a, it's a challenging time. Uh, I think, um, do we have any, oh, the serotonin levels, hang on. I have one more question that we got in about uh, serotonin levels and are they classed as a primary cause for depression? Okay. The brain is extremely complex. Rather than thinking of the brain the way I show it to you in geography, anatomy, kind of fashion in different regions, think of it as a massive computer with multiple, multiple connections. There's not one single neurotransmitter that is associated with depression. There are hundreds of neurotransmitters that could be implicated in depression. Serotonin is one of the ones that's best studied. Now, you cannot take food that's going to bump up your <laughs> serotonin level. Uh -huh. You're going to get all sorts of side effects from those things or uh, vitamins that are being advertised at boosting your serotonin level. That does not work. Your brain does not lack serotonin. What the problem is, is a transmission between cells of the serotonin and how those neurotransmit neurotransmitters are being destroyed or reabsorbed is the issue, not the levels of serotonin per se. Now, there are some uh, 
drugs or medications that can deplete one of the neurotransmitters, for example, dopamine, something that was invented in the 60s called uh, reserpine for blood pressure and depleted dopamine from the brain and patients got horrendously depressed. This is one of the first clues that there was something going on with neurotransmitters, but no, it's not just serotonin. Thank you so much. Um, so many important takeaways today. You know, uh, on this Bell Let's Talk Day, I encourage you to join the conversation. <coughs> Please, uh, when you send a text, when you post on uh, Instagram, when you tweet, when you retweet, use the hashtag Bell Let's Talk. Um, we even have a Facebook filter and a Snapchat filter, so if you're proficient in Snapchat, you can use that <laughs> filter. Uh, we spoke about the numbers about one billion, we're looking for one billion total messages of support for mental health and a hundred million dollars in bill funding today. Incredible. So you have to be part of the conversation. Thank you for being here today. Um, through the Bell Let's Talk Community Fund, Bell has been able to fund important initiatives such as the Let's Connect program led by Dr. Martha McKay. And I'm happy to announce that Bell will once again be supporting this important program with a Bell Let's Talk Community Fund grant of $25,000. The giant check. Giant the giant check. check. <laughs> I'd like to congratulate Martha. Thank you. And her team. And want to Thank say a few you. words yes, I about do. this? You want me to hold do this for you? Yes, Why don't please. I do that? Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. oh wait, I got it. Do I got to stand? Have. Okay. Yeah. Let's stand. Okay. Dr. A Snyder. Yeah. Oh, are we gonna? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So at our Lindhurst Hospital, we recognize that individuals who have experienced a spinal cord injury are at an increased risk for experiencing distressing mood and anxiety symptoms. So our Let's Connect program was first established three years ago thanks to seed funding from Bell. Um, and it's enabled us to create a psychological services specifically for uh, people transitioning from our inpatient services to out, to back into the community, which is important um, as people are now managing multiple stressors and adjusting to the numerous changes in their lives. So this gift today will allow us to expand the service to our outpatients who are now back in the community where resources, as we've discussed, are difficult uh, to find and access. So this generous gift from Bell Let's Talk has been instrumental in allowing us to support the emotional needs and enhance the overall well-being of a greater number of our outpatients with spinal cord injuries. So for that, we thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Tracy. Thank you. Are you kidding? <laughs> so on behalf of all of us at Toronto Rehab and, and the broader community, like right across the country, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for helping us shine a light. Thank you for helping us answer some really important questions uh, that we received. And you're awesome. So uh, a round of applause, please, uh, once again, for Tracy Melton. Thank you. Thank you. For uh, the people that are still uh, online uh, joining us today, please continue. If you have questions, send them in. Uh, we will get back to you uh, over the next couple of days. Uh, Dr. Scheinerman, Dr. McCabe uh, will be helping us uh, respond to you. And so again, huge shout out to uh, Bell. Uh, today's Bell Let's Talk. <laughs> I encourage all of you, we all encourage you, and we will do it as well. Hashtag Bell Let's Talk. So again, thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Thank you, doctors. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. You're so great.